project will never get finished but it's kind of fun just to pluck away at little by little and I figure maybe somebody who comes across the series completed years down the road it might help if Haskell is even still around. <laughs> I hope it will be. Um, but today I just wanted to show you kind of how to make a Cabal project. So out of the uh, out of the project we've already made it's kind of ready to get thrown into a proper Cabal structure. So the first thing I'm going to do is I like to put everything into a source directory. I'm just going to move all the Haskell files into a source directory separate from the tests. And I'll leave our readme there at the top structure. And then I'm going to use the cabal init uh, command, which will kind of lead us through a uh, generic um, kind of interactive setup. Now for package version, uh, the way that Haskell recommends doing uh, package versioning is that uh, anytime that an update is going to break the API version of something you're going to update these two numbers so if somebody else is using your library and you make a change to your project that's going to in, uh, it's going to somehow affect their code then you need to update one of these numbers uh, a lot of people use this for uh, really really big changes and uh, this for kind of minor changes to the API. And then if there's no change to the API per se, but there's new features or there's you know minor changes, then you can update this number here, the third number. And the last number is really just whatever you want it to be. Um, I personally sometimes use this just for um, each commit. Um, I don't update the version every commit, but I just, uh, when I do update the version, count how many commits I've put in, just to get a feel for you know, uh, where I'm at in it. Uh, so, so far I think we have about uh, 15 commits. So, um, based on those 15 commits, uh, we can title the version. I'm just going to put it as a 0.0.1. .0 and then we'll put it under the same license as GNU said, which is the GPL3. I'll leave the author and uh, email as the defaults, and we'll set the project page as the GitHub uh, repository page. So for synopsis, we'll say uh, implementation of said in Haskell, and we'll put it under the text category. And our project's going to build both a library and an executable, but primarily we're building it as a library because we want said to be able to be used in Haskell projects. I mean, realistically it probably won't, but it's just kind of the fun of it. So we'll call this one, we'll leave all these the same, and then it makes three files for us. A license, a setup.hs, and a sed.cabal file, and it's telling us we might want to edit that. So let's take a look at that file. Um, so right off the bat, the extra white space bothers me, so I'll use a little vim command to uh, delete all of the white space at the end of the line. So this is matching any number of uh, space characters that's followed by the end line, and we'll just uh, replace those with nothing on every line. And, and these build depends sometimes bother me. If you ever have like a a list of things comma separated on a line, then you can also use the s command. Uh, notice the lack of percent this time means it only is going to affect this line. And we can change all commas to uh, comma spaces to comma new lines and uh, add a g on that, and that'll throw them onto the next line. And then we can just kind of move them all over. Except I didn't do that correctly. Here we go. Um, so there's a lot of things that go on in this file, and basically what you're going to want to do is you want to make three separate, since we're uh, doing both an executable and a library, we're going to have a section for the library, a section for the executable, and a section for the test suite as well. Um, and this is often you know something that you don't do every day, 
um, you know, editing these these files. So you're probably going to want to look, look up some things online and you know, kind of figure out how to how to work it. Uh, for example, if you didn't, it, it may not be obvious that you don't need main uh, for the library portion. You just need sed and parser. You might even be tempted just to put sed because parser is you know required by sed, but that will give you some tricky errors. So. Um, you know, I kind of work through this stuff piece by piece, and I didn't—I don't know how to do this uh, just off the top of my head. So um, I actually have been working on this in another uh, branch of our of our project here. So I, I like to, when I'm working on videos, I, I usually put it in another branch and work on it there. So I have another branch in my Git repository called Project here, and I've edited this file inside of that. One of the great things about Fugitive, it's a plugin for Vim, is that you can uh, edit files from other branches. So, for example, if I use gedit, I can name the branch that I want to get it from, and then I can supply a path to the file. Um, now, since I'm working on this particular file, Vim has a shortcut on the command line that will put this file's name in there, and that's percent. So all I need to do is type gedit space project colon percent, and that will allow me to edit this file uh, in the project branch. So you may have seen some things change there. That's because we're now editing this file on the project branch. And we can just take a look at what I've done here. So here's the executable section I was talking about, and it sets the main as main.hs. Um, it also tells it where that main.hs is within the source directory. That's where we just put it. And it uh, lists the dependencies that are required to build the executable. Uh, same for the library, where you have to say which modules the library exposes and uh, which dependencies it requires and where it's found. And then finally, the test suite. Uh, the type here, exit code uh, stdio, uh, basically means it's going to test the executable and give it an exit code if it fails. And the main here is going to be main, but this time it's within the test directory. And it requires a few dependencies that the other uh, sections did not, such as process, hunit, and test framework. Now, one other thing we can do here that I haven't done yet is just, uh, we can, uh, so let's copy all of this and just come back to our other uh, file and we'll paste it all in. So now we're back in our, um, in our working branch. And we're no longer editing the the one on the other branch, we just copied and pasted everything from that file into this one. So now we can edit it. And I'm just going to add a few GHC options to each of these sections to turn warnings on in case something goes wrong. So we can just kind of paste that in and to each section. Okay. So now that's, th that's done, we'll take a look at our project here. Uh, we can even do a tree. What this uh, said that cabal file allows us to do is um, basically to um, operate on the project as a whole with the dependencies that it requires. So one way that we can do this without uh, interacting with our system GHC packages is to create a sandbox. So all you need to do is execute the command cabal sandbox init and that will create a new sandbox in this directory. So now we can look at our tree again it's given us this new file, cabal.sandbox.config. It's also given us um, a hidden directory called .cabal.sandbox. And if there's any dependencies that our project requires, it can install them into this folder instead of affecting our system. Um, and that's nice in case we need specific versions of particular things that our system doesn't have installed. And uh, you know, cabal can be really difficult to fix if you get into trouble there. So I like to just keep it in a sandbox. So after that, when you use cabal install, cabal install will read the cabal file that we just edited and install the dependencies necessary into that sandbox. And because we're going to want to run tests, we also have to add this dash dash, dash enable dash tests uh, to the end of it. So I'm going to run that real quick. And then it's going to, as you can see, configure all the dependencies that are necessary for our project. And it says it's installing them. It's installing them into that sandbox directory. So this will take a minute. Um, I'll just fast forward through this. OK, 
Okay, so now that that's finished, uh, we can actually configure the um, Cabal package. And then we can run our test suite just by specifying the name we put in that Cabal file. So Cabal test. Uh, because we put the dash w all, uh, we are getting uh, a lot of warnings that we haven't uh, taken care of yet. Um, and we can correct those as we go along, but uh, the test suite did pass, as you can see right here. If you want to see um, more details about it, you can uh, show details always as a flag here. And let's run that again, and then we'll see our actual test output as we did before. And so that basically has uh, put our package together. Um, we can look at the status here of things and uh, we can tell that we need to we need to add uh, certain files but not others to our repository. So we don't need the sandbox uh, particularly. We do need the license, the setup, the sed.cabal file, and the source. Um, this uh, distribution is also something that the, uh, the actual build makes. So we can look inside this Cabal sandbox for a second and see that it looks similar to the uh, home directory's Cabal uh, directory. And this is where all the packages for our dependencies will be installed. So we'll just go ahead and, uh, let's see, let's go ahead and commit that as, um, Set up Cabal or set up project with Cabal in it. Okay. Uh, the second part of what I want to do in this uh, in this video was just to uh, take a look at what it's like to merge a pull request from somebody. So I'm going to open up a browser here and I'm going to go to my GitHub uh, and this uh, repository. You see that somebody has offered uh, a pull request here. It's a uh, it's a uh, he no he noticed that uh, the regular expressions in the substitute command are compiled every time that command is executed. When you could just uh, you could just compile the regular expression in the parser itself instead of while the command is being executed, and then you'd only do it once instead of every time the command is executed. So it's only done one commit, this, uh, this commit right here, it's a the title looks fine. So uh, and then you can look at the changes here and I'll show you what changes he made. So he's changing um, the type here from string to uh, rejects because he needs to, uh, uh, he, he's doing it in the parser and then passing it to said as a, as a regex. And then you can see here in the uh, parser it's it's also uh, compiling it. And then here, instead of uh, compiling it in the set file, it's just uh, using the already compiled regex. So uh, one thing we might want to do now is we can, uh, we can actually uh, pull down his uh, branch into our branch. So GitHub will actually give you instructions on how to do this. It says you can merge branches on the command line. So we'll look here, and uh, it'll say, you know, from your project repository, check out a new branch, and then test the changes. So we can uh, you know, go back to our command line here and uh, create a new branch. Uh, it, uh, GitHub suggests doing it as the name of the person that's supplying the command, so we can do that. I'll make a new branch uh, that's the same as our master. Um, this CB is just an uh, alias for checkout-b, so you could also do git checkout-b and do the same thing. And uh, then we can pull what he's trying to merge into this branch. So we'll just copy this command right here, and uh, you know it'll pull it down. Since we're on a testing branch, I don't mind doing a merger like this. And now you can see it has uh, Alexander Lehman's compiler reg regex only once, and it's merged into the uh, into the branch I'm currently on, which is the one of his name. So um, 
now we can look at a difference versus head one, and this is exactly what GitHub was showing us a second ago, the changes that he made. Um, so based on that, we can now run our test suite again and uh, see if it passes. Now, this is not, uh, you know, this is going to pass simply because we don't really have any tests yet that are testing the substitute command, so we can't exactly be sure. Um, if the changes he made are going to hurt anything right now until we make some tests for the substitute command later. But I feel fairly confident about the changes he's made and since we haven't tested the substitute command yet anyways we will have to work out the kinks in it later when we do write those tests. So I feel okay uh, going ahead and merging his commit in. And uh, the way I'm going to do that actually uh, to avoid having these kind of branch branches off of your project Instead of uh, merging in this way, you can just uh, cherry pick the commit out. So if I go back to my master branch, um, since I don't have anything pending right now, I just have some untracked files, I can just cherry pick the uh, commit that he is offering to merge in in this way. And then it's just going to stack it right on top of the commits I've already made instead of having all that merge business. And uh, now you can see the head and master is, is moved to, to this position. And, you know, just for sanity, we can run the tests again, just to make sure they're still passing, even though it doesn't really do anything uh, to our project. And they are passing. So I feel OK with uh, merging that commit in. So now what's going to happen is um, I can tag this as uh, episode 7. And when I push it to master, when I come back here, if we refresh this um, and we go back to the project page, uh, so if we go back to the project page and look at the commits here, it's going to show that uh, his uh, commit was put into put into here, and it also tells you that I'm the one who committed it. So uh, now I can. Uh, you know, it used to be that GitHub would actually just go ahead and close this pull request when it found that the commit was merged in. Um, I'm not sure why it doesn't do that anymore, but but now we can uh, you know we can find this page here, we can copy it, and uh, go back to his pull request, and I'll just uh, you know just say thanks. Or, or actually, let's see here. If I come here, I can just copy uh, copy this to the clipboard. And then when I come back to the pull request, I'll just paste that in here. Uh, uh, we only really need seven characters of this anyway, so I can delete all that. And I'll just say thanks, merged at, and then I'll have that little SHA-1, and I can say closing comment. And if you click on this, then it'll show you where I merged his uh, commit in. So that'll close the pull request, and uh, you know, now I don't have any pending pull requests in the project. So thank you, uh, Alexander, for finding that, and I uh, hope that this video has been helpful, and thank you so much for watching.